pugs are surprisingly quiet for the most part. Okay. But <laughs> randomly, then she started howling at one point. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Roxy, <laughs> down. <laughs> Welcome to Expert Life Germany, the podcast about life in Germany as seen through the eyes of outsiders. I'm your host, Sean Behrens, and this week, my guest is Mari from the USA, who currently lives in southern Germany, and she is just about to release her debut novel. How cool is that? It's called The God Queen, and it will be released next week on the 22nd of October. It's a new adult space opera, and I'll read the description. The God Queen is a compelling tale of a young woman trying to wrestle with the truth about her own identity and expectations brought with it. Mari talks about the book in our interview and about the challenges she faced being an English writer in Germany. She's also an avid pug fan, and she discusses bringing her pug Abna with her to Germany when she moved. And that was she's got some funny stories, uh, quite entertaining, uh, but also informative. If you're wondering what it takes to bring a pet to Germany, maybe you're thinking of making a move and you're wondering if you should bring your pets with or not. Marie, in this week's episode, explains just some things about uh, what you need to do to get a dog from the USA, at least, to Germany. It's a fun interview, but before we get into it, I just want to let you know, Mari has very graciously agreed to give away one signed copy of her book. I'll tell you how you can win it after the interview. Now, here's Mari. So Mari, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you very much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. Why don't you start by telling me your background? So where you come from originally... Sure. Uh, well, I was born and raised in uh, Indiana. My mother is Peruvian and my father is American, and I grew up uh, in a bicultural household. Uh, mm-hmm. she, oh, my mom only spoke Spanish to me, my dad English, and I spoke Spanglish until I went to school and learned how to speak <laughs> English properly. So my parents had both decided that uh, they really wanted to for me to have a foot in both cultures. So, you know, they made sure that like I celebrated not only 4th of July, but the 28th of July, which is proving independence day. So then how, how is it that you ended up in Germany? So, um, I eventually made a move to Chicago to work for a German pharma company. And, uh, this was a company that, that they literally were trying to bring everything from Germany to the States, like, because they didn't even know where to even get business cards like they're like well if we don't know we'll just bring it from germany <laughs> and uh and that included uh the machinery as well as the engineers <laughs> so uh there are a few of the programmers that came during maintenance mm-hmm. and uh i met this young man who was one of the programmers and we got along very well and we started a long distance relationship and then made the decision that i would transfer within the German company to their headquarters in Germany to see if this relationship would work. All right. So you you did it for love. Yeah, I pretty much did exactly what my mother did. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, History repeating itself. Exactly. And about the same age too. I was uh, also about 26. Really? Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, I guess it becomes easier to do these kinds of things if your parents were already kind of, they had that adventurous spirit to pack up everything and start a new life in a new country. Oh, yeah, yeah. And and on top of that, like, you know, whenever you're having, you know, you know, like maybe a bad day, your parents are the ones you can talk to about it because they went through yeah. it as well. Like that was, that was it was amazing to have my mom <laughs> during, <laughs> during those bad days. And, and from what some of the experiences she had, it made my days look like nothing. So it also put things into perspective. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So you, so, so what is it that you do actually? Did you, you, you said engineering is, are you an engineer or a programmer? Um, I I was a microbiologist for almost 10 years. Um, so we, yeah, so that was the thing I, I just literally transferred within departments just within microbiology. And that was, uh, very stressful because I arrived on a Saturday and Monday I started my new job and it was all in German. Same job, but oh all in German. And I had some background, but yeah, yeah, that learn, learning curve was very steep those first six months. <laughs> I think they referred to that as the deep end. Yeah, it very much was the deep end. So your level your level of German was just kind of beginner level at that point or oh, yeah. had you already started learning? Okay. I, I did. I had I'd taken two years in college and... At the, while the the company I worked for, they also offered classes through the Goethe Institute, 
Mm-hmm. So I also, I took advantage of it. I was like, why not? I like languages and it's free. Sure. Yeah, and, why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> so it was, and, and actually the company did pay for further courses um, because they, 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 since my, everything I had to do was in German as well as, you know, write investigations and write reports. They're like, well, we mm. need you to, you know, hop, hop, get this as a, uh, <laughs> get as fast as, as advanced as possible in your German. So and yeah. How like successful I, you said, you said six months because I still think my written German is horrendous and I've been here for 12 years. Well, uh, I mean, it, yeah. Oh, I, when it comes to the, to the articles, oh, the, don't even talk to me about articles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, whenever I'm, I'm asking to like spell a word, I just go to my husband like, "Oh, so what is it? Dirty das? <laughs> like, I'm just, I'm just, I don't even know what it is. Dirty das. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've given up on daddy das. I just take it oh, as yeah. it comes. Whatever. Yeah, I just exactly. throw whatever in there. Yeah, that's what I do. And then I mean, he'll correct me afterwards, but usually I'm just like, ah, we'll just we're just gonna we're gonna, we're gonna play a little Russian roulette. We'll see how it works. <laughs> I got one in three chances. Well, like more one one in nine, depending on where it is in the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, I'd say the first six months, because after that six months, it was the first time I went home for Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. And uh, I almost had not quite reverse culture shock, but it was uh, like I'd had this this idea of home built into my head, you know, during, the, right. during those those bad days where I'm like, oh, back in America, it's better. And then when I get yeah. home and and then I'm like, oh, no, it's. It's the the idea that I had in my head doesn't match reality, and and not not that yeah. America sucks or anything. It's just what I had it's in my different. head was yeah, it, what I had in my head was a fantasy, yeah. and uh, I realized that my life in Germany really wasn't it wasn't terrible. That's <laughs> I interesting. Actually, That's I actually the... quite enjoyed it, and it, it, it <laughs> things things like started to get easier after that. I feel like you got some perspective on on Germany as opposed to the fantasy of home. Yep. What what specifically was it when you when you got there when you say you, you you said kind of reverse culture shock? What kind of things was it that you looked at and said, okay, that that's not so bad back in Germany? I think the roads that was a big shock. <laughs> the, we, we yeah, this last year in Indiana, they they had some some problems with with the roads. Uh, they there were potholes. I went I went home uh, in February. Totally non sequitur, but I. Uh, went to surprise my mom for her birthday and the roads were so bad you had to like swerve it i a cop could have probably thought it was a drunk driver or something it was just it was so just, bad yeah. and i was like i would never see the infrastructure in germany is just so much better you know it was just something as simple as roads you know mm-hmm. and and mm-hmm. and for in the winter you know i live in a very tiny village with like 20 30 houses and the roads are cleaner out here than on a major road back home and yeah, I just thought, oh wow, like Germany, like yeah, you pay higher taxes, but it, they really do use it to take care of its people. That's one of the things about Germany is that things are pretty well kept up, despite how much Germans complain and uh, even some expats complain. Absolutely, absolutely. My uh, my when we got married, my family, a huge group of my family came over. It was like thirty five people, and. I remember my brother-in-law being absolutely shocked with not even seeing roadkill. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just like the, I mean, that's just take you know they take care of that very quickly. You know, yeah, they do. They do. They do. It, it, just something as simple as that. And he's a cop, so he's like on obviously on the road all the time doing patrols. Yeah. And yeah, he was just he was absolutely impressed with with how everything was just so clean and orderly and no yeah, that road was kill. no roadkill. <laughs> <laughs> So you moved to you, – you you live in a little village. Is it still Franconia or is it on the other side of the border? Um, on the other side of the border. We're we're like Baden maybe 50. Yeah, Baden württemberg We're technically in the area known as Hohenlohe um, and it is like 15 minutes from the border. Like I'm 20 minutes away from Rotenburg. Yeah, that's that's my go-to. Rodenberg of the Tauber is my go-to place to take visitors who come and visit. Yeah, in Germany. same here, same here. It's like it's perfect. <laughs> it's like yeah, it's like your own personal Disney World. So, how did you end up where you are? Is that where the headquarters of the company is? No, so technically, um, the headquarters of the company is in Ravensburg. So that's uh, in uh, Oberschwaben, I think. Okay. And so in Swabia, right. so it's it's not too far from like Constance. Right. Um, and so my my husband now, but he was my boyfriend at the time. He also transferred within companies to a site in Switzerland, in Berlin, so right outside, uh, right outside of Schaffhausen, mm-hmm. which is on the border. Uh, and we found we lived in the little city of Überlingen, which is almost like exactly in between the two cities. And we just did long commutes for the first four years that we uh, that I was living here in Germany. <clears throat> What's long commute? How long was uh, that? 
for me it was 45 minutes for him it was about an hour with the train or by car no by car because he'd have to cross the border he had to go through border control every day okay yeah, so we did that, and yeah, and it was fun. You know, we we loved Uberlingen, um, but the the social life was a little harder because all of his friends were in Switzerland, all of my friends were in Robinsburg, and so mm-hmm. we wanted to, you know, ju- trying to juggle all that. And then we had our dog as well, and you know, somebody has to go home to take care of the dog. You can't just yeah. leave the poor creature there. So, yeah. yeah, it was it was very hard to juggle all that, and and then eventually we decided we also would like to have a house and we want to start thinking about having a family. And so the best place to, to, would be to come back to his hometown, which is what we did. And we are now living in the family house. And uh, there, then we, we had to, well, he went back to the company he was previously. So he's still within the same company. He just transferred back. And I managed to get a job at that same company, but as a translator. That so was whoa, a big shift. Whoa, complete gear change. <laughs> it was a huge <laughs> right? shift. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, finding microbiology out here is almost impossible. There aren't really any lab jobs out here. So I had to think about what I could do. But fortunately, it's still technically in pharma. My job is to take the German documentation and make sure that the English is cr- written correctly. Okay. Since a lot of the customers are, they speak English or at least like, English will be the next step before it's further translated, but the English has to be at least, you know, solid from right. German to English. Yeah. Yeah, sure. It still worked out. <laughs> yeah. So you are, as I mentioned earlier, you are also a writer in your spare time. You've just uh, written your debut novel, if I understand it correctly. Is it your first first yeah. book? Uh, first book that I'm having published. Um, uh-huh. I've written I, this, this specific novel I started writing when I was about 13, actually. Wow. And uh, I have rewritten, I don't even know how many versions, maybe six or seven versions since then. Uh Every time, you know, when I've learned something more about writing or some new aspect that I, you know, just everything having to do with writing and anything that I learned that I wanted to improve on, then sometimes I would just go back to square one with with these characters essentially and start start over. Um, eventually I did try putting the project down because I thought, you know, I'm maybe getting a little too involved and then work on some other projects down the line, but then I always kept coming back. And so eventually I came up with this version that I'm really happy with and decided, all right, we'll actually do this editor thing and, and see what happens. Yeah. Let it out. Who, who is the target readership and maybe give me a bit of an idea of what the book's about. Technically, um, it is a space opera mm-hmm. that uh, I target as new adult. Uh, new adult is a very, very new genre. It's kind of in between young adult and adult. Okay. It's, essentially, it's has similar, I wouldn't say the same tropes as young adult. I mean, the most important thing is that the characters are older. So they're not teenagers. They are adults, but they're young adults. <laughs> <laughs> this is starting to at make least, sense now. Hang on. Right? Absolutely. You know, I mean, they're like, in, they're at least, the, the, you know, the earliest is like the early 20s, yeah. maybe 19, like right. it's above 18, like they are adults. Okay. Um, so then, you know, you can you can write a little more explicit sex scenes or you can be a little Ooh. more more uh, explicit with, uh, you know, violence or whatever. You know what I mean? Like you can yeah. you can take things a little bit more to the level right. because with young adult, you have- I suppose. Exactly. Yeah. What is what is it about? Give, maybe, maybe give me a brief overview of what the uh, what the book is about. Sure, sure. So it is called the God Queen, and mm-hmm. it is about a young woman who discovers that she is a reincarnated god and has to come to terms with what that means. Because this is, this is like I said, it's a space opera. So while there is fantasy and magic to it, this is also set very far into the future, where there are spaceships and interplanetary travel, and it's kind of like a, a, a meld of these two genres. Right. And there's a huge, I wouldn't say battle, but there's there's a lot of tension between these two political factions, and she is essentially being pulled in one direction as kind of a figurehead. But she doesn't want that. She has her own motivations and her own goals, and so that ends up clashing with the people in charge, so to speak. And so how she tries to find her own voice and decide what she wants to do, and that's okay. kind of what the first book very, dives into. Very intriguing. And the first four chapters are uh, available on your website, I think I saw. Yes, yes. So this book is done? It's about to come out, yeah. isn't it? Yes, it's coming out October 22nd. Okay, very exciting. That must be a good feeling. It is, it is, especially, oh, like I said, I, I started this when I was 13. Even yeah. my mother was just like, just publish it already. <laughs> <laughs> just put it out there, for God's sake. Just like, this, is, this is like having a baby, but it's taking you 20 years to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you self-publish? Is this self-published or 
or are you going through some kind of publishing house? It it, it is self published uh, mostly because since I've spent so long on it. Uh, in order to be traditionally published, of course, you have to get an agent, and that can take one yeah. to two years. And then once you have an agent, right. they have to pitch to a house, which is another one to two years. And then once they accept mm-hmm. it, that's at least maybe another year before it's out. And I do want to be hybrid, though. I'm not. I, I, I'm not trying to, you know, totally go against the traditional publishing route because I have some projects that I that are not having to do with the series, but with other other ideas in mind that I would like to see go the the traditional route. And a lot of authors have done that. But, but the thing just, is, it's so easy nowadays to, I mean, easy, I, I use that word very, very loosely, but it's possible. Let's put it that way. It's possible to self-publish and get get things out there. It is. It, it is possible to come out with a good quality product. Yes. Because that is that is a, a big problem we do for, with with the self-publishing route nowadays, because all especially with Amazon, all you have to do is click publish. You're, it's out yeah. there. A lot of people assume, oh, you just you know, you upload it and then the people will come to you and no, there's, there is, you know, yeah, especially with the marketing. And that was actually a big reason why in the end I went with self-publishing because a lot of people assume, oh, well, I get to go to the publishing house and I'll just, you know, the publishing house will do all the marketing for me. And no, they won't. When you're a debut yeah. author, no, no, they won't. Because no, until no you're going to help you with that. No, no, they're not. Until you're a, an, a, a guarantee return on investment like Stephen King or George R. R. Martin yeah. or Sarah J. Moss, they're not going to help yeah. you. They are, you're going to be expected to do most of the heavy lifting. Yeah. And that marketing is not an easy thing because there is no. so much noise out there. It is very it's difficult very to difficult. get out yeah. and, and stand out. Yeah. And a lot of writers are introverts and it's like, I have to go out and talk to people. Yeah. What? This is not what I signed up for. <laughs> are you Are you an introvert? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I could, I could have, I could have answered that already. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's made. I mean, the marketing is it's actually been very fun because I enjoy reaching out to people, and I've made some mm-hmm. really good friends as a result yeah. of it, and it's it's just been really fun. But you've got the added challenge of being a, a writer of English books in the middle of Germany. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Has that yeah. made things more difficult for you? Is that more it, of a challenge? Well, in in a way, yes, because there are a lot of resources that are unavailable to me. Um, the the biggest one that example that I always use is when when you're self publishing, you have to get an ISBN number, mm-hmm. which you know every format requires it: yeah, yeah. hardback, or paperback, ebook, audiobook. They all require something speci- uh, like a separate one. The question for me was, where do I buy it? I am publishing an English-speaking book, but I am based in Germany. And so I had to go and, and do research. And it turns out because technically the book is being, quote unquote, published in Germany, I have to buy a German ISBN number. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. So I did that. That was that was painless enough. But then where do I register it? And I thought, oh, well, then I just register in Germany as well. No, unfortunately, because uh, the German – Agency where where you sign up only works within German speaking circles. So my book would be dead on arrival essentially if I signed yeah. my book up yeah. through them. Uh, and it, it was a very stressful two days where I was essentially emailing both them and Boker, which is the American version. Oh, what right. do I do? Like I and, and I was getting close to the time where I was going to announce pre-sale, and I was like, oh, I thought I would have had this information by now. Like, what yeah. is this? You know, stressing yeah. out and and yeah, so. That was that was very stressful. Just that finding those resources for my specific case, like how do I do such and such from here in Germany? Like, what do I need to do? Yeah. Where do I go? How do you know where? Where am I going to publish it? Like for taxes, pa- uh, tax reasons, because as an American, I'm still expected to declare my taxes in the United States, even though I live in Germany. Right. So. Yeah, there's there there are a lot of like these other little it's it's little things like you have AuthorTube and you have you know websites out there that can help you. So it helps maybe at least eighty percent of the way, but there's still that last twenty percent where yeah. where you're doing it from abroad and you're like, oh no, what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that that sounds tough. That sounds really yeah, tough. it's stress it's stressful, but I unfortunately know these things for next time. So. I mean, that's, a, that's it exactly. That's it. Now, uh, for, for book two, it should be a bit of an easier process to get through. Oh, the, yeah. I'm very much – I'm looking forward to doing book two. I think it's going to be really fun, like a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> but as a result, because of not having these resources, I have um, actually decided to start up a YouTube channel down the line okay. um, where I could, all, I could offer these resources um, because Help I – Help out. Help out other writers in Germany. Exactly. You mean, I'm just uh, in in Germany, but also just abroad, just to know what kind of questions you need to ask. Yeah. 
So yeah, that's uh, that'll be my goal as well because it was so frustrating for me to not to have that resources. I feel if I could at least help another writer out there, it would have been, it would be worth it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would all be worth it. Well, this is it's very exciting, and I wish you all of the, all of the best of luck with the book. And thank you, thank you. Yeah, taking a look at your blog and your social media posts, it becomes quite clear that you uh, you are a pug fan. Yes. Oh, yeah. I love pugs. <laughs> yeah. Yes, <laughs> it is. Bad. It is obvious. And uh, <laughs> you had a pug named Abner who sadly yes. passed away in April this year. Oh yeah, he. Uh, I got him right out of college. Okay. Uh, so I was about 23 and, uh, I mean, he was my little buddy for my first job, first apartment. We moved to Chicago together. And when I moved to Germany, I knew without a question, he would come with me. So he moved with me to Germany. So there was, there was never a point where that was going to be a logistical problem. It was just, no, I I would, even if I had to smuggle him in my backpack, (laughs) I didn't care. I didn't care, but I knew, I knew it was possible. Um, it was just, as soon as I made the decision, to move to Germany, um, I ha- actually have a friend that is a USDA certified vet, and I asked her what I needed to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, that is actually the first thing you do need to do is find a USDA certified vet. Okay. USDA, that's the United States uh, Department of Agriculture, because you are transporting a non-human living being right. across borders. Right. I-, I think a lot of people will be interested in the steps. So first of all, you have to get a, a, a USDA certified vet and then mm-hmm. what, what what is it that they have to do well so you you go and you take your animal to the vet and you tell them where you want to move say in my case i say i want to move to germany or if you want to move to thailand or if you want to move to the uk because they will know the the laws that's specific like because certain countries require quarantine especially for like the uk or i even believe australia because they're islands mm-hmm. Or, you know, they just require paperwork and they'll know what forms. And in my case, they knew exactly what form was for Germany. And with Germany, they didn't need really anything. Okay. Uh, the dog just needed to be fit. And um, well, so, yeah, then I had to come in for uh, to make sure that they, that Abner was fit. Then the vet filled out all the necessary forms for me. Then I had to come in within 10 days of the flight to do it for a deworming. Mm. And this is, I believe, required of all from like all animals that leave the United States. Okay. They're, they're given um, a pill for deworming and then the final bits for the paperwork are signed. And then you have to take that paperwork and go to your local USDA office and have that stamped. Okay. And then you're ready to go. Which that's it. Yeah. It's very easy. And you just have it with you when you go. Okay. So then, so then the, the, uh, the, the, the pug was with you. Abner was with you on the flight when you went over. Yes. I, I was fortunate with that because he is a, I think it's pronounced brachycephalic. It's a right. the the yeah the, the little the snub the flat nose yeah. that they have. Um, for a lot of for those that also with bulldogs, they are forbidden in cargo, especially in the summer months, right. because it's not temperature controlled, yeah. and they can suffocate. Yeah. So unfortunately, Abner was on on like I would say the German word. He was on the grenze. He was like right at the at the weight limit. Uh, I had to make him lose a few pounds. Had to go on a diet to come to Germany. <laughs> yeah, come on, boy. I didn't put him on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's. I mean, he was for a pug. He was. He was rather large, which was funny because I think he was the runt when I got him. Uh-huh. He was very tiny, and then he turned out to be this like massive creature. <laughs> he did all right. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He was very well fed. I can tell you that. <laughs> and uh, but it was. It was. It was totally fine. Um, my concern, of course, I, I had looked for a direct flight. That was, of course, tricky because direct flights are also like outrageously expensive. Yeah. But so I flew directly from Chicago to Frankfurt, and I had you had to have a certain size, like a I think medium Sherpa is the the brand, like a medium sized Sherpa soft crate that okay. fits under the, the 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 seat in front of you. Okay, uh, that's what they usually recommend for the animal. And, and like I said, Abner was already on the the limit even just height wise he was he was also very tall hmm. so he had to fit under there and i and i also had uh, got economy plus so that i would actually have room <laughs> once i stuffed him in there because he wasn't he was still kind of like half sticking out and then i remember the the day of the actual flight was very stressful so i mean i tried to do all the minimum that i that i could and i had you know was carrying him and te- i thought they were going to have him consider him as like another carry on Right, but that's um, what I would expect too. Usually, I think yeah, I think it depends on the person because I was ex- that's what I had read, uh, yeah. but they they didn't and they let me carry something else, 
and I was like, crap, now I have like two things and a dog that yeah. I have to like wheel about. So that was, yeah. that was very stressful. Oh, and then another thing that you do have to do, you have to call the airline when you're actually getting your flight because the flights are usually only allowed so many dogs on the plane and they almost never fill to capacity, like whatever, the, whatever that number is that. So that's not right. a problem, but you still need to call to make sure that that's okay and that they're aware. And it's, I believe it's an extra for at least in cargo was like another two hundred fifty dollars to add wow. to, the, wow. to the, yeah, exactly. That's pricey. That is pricey, and that's just for car uh, for in your carry on. I cannot imagine yeah. what it would be for cargo for a bigger dog. Yeah. But um, for a small dog, I mean, when you're moving and it's a one time thing, yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's fine. It's, it's, yeah, <laughs> exactly. in, the, in the grand scheme of things, it's actually nothing if if, if you're getting there and starting a new life. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, my my relatives had always asked me when I was bringing Abner back, and I was like, uh, <laughs> are you going to give me like five hundred dollars to fly him there and back? <laughs> oh, and then you know to go through all that paperwork again with the USDA, like oh god, no. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm like, no, He's no. He's German dog. now. He's German. He's, he's yeah, exactly. He's, he's, he's already given up his American passport. We're done with that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So the day of the flight, yeah. like I said, it was a, a direct flight. Thank goodness. We, uh, I said goodbye to my parents. I went to through security and they actually expected me to take him out of the crate because they had to scan his crate through, through an x-ray. And so I had to carry him through the, the, <laughs> The metal detector. And then okay. and I remember they wanted to to swipe my hands. You know, they always check for like bomb yeah. residue or something. There's so I had to like hands, – Exactly. I know. So I actually uh, – fortunately, I mean, Abner was always so chill. So I was able to kind of just kind of rock him onto my elbows so that right. my hands were free. And he was just laying on his back just – <laughs> hanging out <laughs> the tsa is relentless aren't they they, they do they not are. care what the context is you will be exactly. searched the way that you need to be searched <laughs> no i know they're like there is a i don't care if you're if you're carrying a dog i'm gonna swipe your hands like, all right guys we're gonna, we're gonna make this work i guess <laughs> so and then um I mean, but that was it, fortunately. And everybody laughed when they saw me, like, you know, have to roll my dog yeah. around. And he was just, you know, chill. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> Though getting him back into the crate was a nightmare because he did not like that crate. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm but, sure. He's, uh, got, I, he's got his first taste of freedom since he was in there the last time. He's not getting exactly. back in there. Oh, and the, and, the, and the screaming. Like, when he had to when I had to close it, oh, just, it, really? you know, you can, like, you can still hear it. You still wake <laughs> up at night. You can hear uh, those screams. It's like it's terrible. Silence of the Lambs. No. <laughs> <laughs> just, just want to tell him, listen, boy, it's going to be okay. This is exactly. just temporary. But he, yeah, but, it must be yeah, terrible though, to hear. But what I did, what I did uh, discover was, as long as I left the upper flap open so he can stick his head out, he was happy. Okay. And then mm. my my dad was, thank goodness, he was he gave me he had the foresight. He gave me um, one of those old like what you would put your luggage on to be able to like wheel it before you know luggage had wheels. So I was able to attach the crate to that so I could wheel Abner about because he was. 23 pounds, yeah, 21 much. pounds. You don't want to carry That's, that around the whole day. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah. And once he had his head sticking out, he was just super happy. Oh, thank goodness. And then uh, then we got onto the plane. And okay. once we got onto the plane, I got him under the seat. Uh, I still left the flap open and he just, he chilled. I mean, he was very stressed out the whole flight, of course. But uh, as long as he could see me, he was fine, which was right. the the most important thing. Yeah. And I made sure I had a puppy pad in there in case he had an accident, but he actually held it the whole time. I was super okay. impressed. That's amazing. I know. <laughs> it was, I mean, it was an eight hour flight and then, you know, you have like two hours before and then, yeah. you know, it was, I was super impressed with the dog, but. That must've been a stress um, as well. Like just thinking, it, when, when's he going to do something? What, and you don't want to yeah. bother people yeah. around you with smells and whatever. Exactly, exactly. Oh, I felt like, oh man, but he was, he was such a trooper. He was such okay. a trooper. And, and I made sure I always had treats. I always had to feed him, you know, his favorite treats. And then I made sure to give him water at least every two hours. Cause I didn't want to give him too much in case he needed to pee, but I yeah. also didn't want him dehydrated. So sure. it was, you know, trying to, to play that. And, and for the most part, he was fine until, of course, the descent. Because you know, descent, I, even with babies, yeah. you know, it's when they're the ear pre the mm -hmm. ear pressure changes and they don't know what's happening. So he was just licking his face a lot. Didn't didn't he, know how to deal with this new exactly, sensation. Exactly, new sensation. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And then uh, we arrive, and then one of the stewardesses came by. She goes, "Oh, there was a dog on this flight." <laughs> <laughs> That's a good boy. Then you know, it was, yeah, then, you know, was, the dog has been amazing. Yeah, yeah, he was he was very good. He was he was very he was he was amazing. Yeah. So, so then he was, he landed in Germany and from the blog post that I've seen on your blog site, because you actually did quite a lot of blog posts uh, detailing his adventures. 
And it seems like Ebner had a life full of adventure beyond what beyond what many people experience in their lifetimes. He he did a lot of traveling, right? He did, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I I uh, learned very quickly. I mean, he's you know, pugs are very food motivated. So once he realized that if he posed pretty for the camera, <laughs> that he would get treats. <laughs> Then I could uh, take lots of photos of him. So okay. yeah, we took him to Venice. We took him to Milan and parts of Austria, and we took him sledding in Switzerland. And amazing. Yeah, it was it was he was such a good dog. Yeah, and I I uh, recommend people if they're interested in following the <laughs> adventures of Abner back um, back in the day to to go and have a look at your blog. Um, but now yes. now there's a new pug in the picture. There is. Yes, we actually just picked her up last week. Um, she is what's actually called a retro pug. I, te- technically, I think Abner would f- also fall under the classification of retro pug because he ac- he had a nose. He had, didn't have a complete flat face. And Roxy also doesn't. She has a little bit longer legs than Abner did. And the point is that the pugs look like what pugs used to look like in ancient times. Like It's a, two- a 2,000 year old race. Okay. And the idea is that, especially with having more of a nose, they can breathe better. Right. We searched for ones that were selling specifically a retro pug. Okay. And we adopted her. And uh, do you have uh, trips and uh, adventures planned for for, for her? Uh, so, I mean, we're going to start small at the moment because she's only three months. We're just oh, yeah. going to you know, do a lot of local stuff. But um, my best friend is actually coming to Sweden in the end of November for her birthday and asked me to come visit her. Ooh. So it would be, yeah, essentially her first trip. Okay. Very yeah. cool. So that would be, that would be, oh, goodness gracious. Yeah. Sorry. Did you hear that? Okay. Oh. You hear Roxy barking. <laughs> <laughs> well, she is part of the podcast, so it makes sense. She is part of the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pugs are surprisingly quiet for the most part. Okay. But then a re- a randomly, then she started howling at one point. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Roxy, <laughs> down. <laughs> no, she's she is really riled up today. I have no idea why. And so my husband's trying to like keep her entertained. And we had we given her like a a dentist stick earlier, and she just like practically inhaled it. I thought it would last a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> it's done now. Next exactly, next yeah. trick. <laughs> next trick. Yeah. Oh goodness. Before we finish up, I want to ask you for expats coming to Germany. What is the biggest Mm -hmm. bit of advice from your experience that you could give them? Just general expat advice, or maybe you want to give them writing advice. What what, what advice would you have to give them? To not worry about making mistakes when you're learning the language. Mm -hmm. That was a big thing because, I mean, for me, because technically German was my, is my third language. Growing up, I had to, you know, speak English and Spanish. And actually my, my mother would send me to Peru by myself in order to to better my Spanish wow. and to not allow me to speak English to anybody. Huh. So I had to get over that first learning curve very young where it doesn't matter if you're grammatically correct. You just have to speak. You have to just have to get, get those out. words out. Eventually, once you have that confidence, later on, you can focus on the grammar. But until then, just speak, just get out there. like, mm. And ignore the weird looks you may get from from that small percentage of people that you know that just don't understand because most people they will try to help you they yeah. you know they do appreciate that you're wanting to learn their language and they will try to find a way to meet you halfway yeah that's what yeah, exactly what i found as well they I, yeah. I very often get scrunched up faces when i say something in german and i know okay i've just said <laughs> something weird i don't know they, they I guess they don't but they're very Kind of about and, and that scrunched up face isn't judgmental. It's kind of just them trying to figure out what the hell I meant. Trying to figure out what you said. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Yep. Cool. Yep. Well, thank you very much for reaching out and coming on the show, Marie. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. I wish you all the best for the book going forward. And yeah, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I continue to hear all your other interviews because you have such awesome people on your show so. ah, thank you it's 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 actually i was thinking the other day that my podcast is actually pretty easy because i let my guests do all the work i just kind of like right. i just have to make sure i'm getting interesting enough people and then they do all the work so it's a yeah, pretty yeah, good no, gig you, yeah yeah that's awesome i really <laughs> i really like it and yeah i look forward to your to your next episodes no ah, thanks thanks for listening It's such a cool thing to have a novelist on the show. Thank you so much, Mari, for coming. Now, I mentioned at the start of this show that we are giving away a signed copy of her book, The God Queen. Here's what you need to do to win it. 
on all of the social media networks. I'll share a post announcing this episode, as I usually do. I do it every week. There's a sort of a picture of the episode and a short blog post that goes with it, and I share that on social media. So on Facebook, you need to share that post in your network. And unfortunately, on Facebook, you'll have to send me an instant message to Expat Life Germany to let me know that you shared it, because I can't always see who has shared the posts depending on privacy settings that you might have. That's Facebook. On Twitter, retweet that sucker. I can see who retweets, so no need to message me. Or if you want to talk, message me. I don't mind. Also on Instagram, everyone who tags a friend that might be interested in either the podcast or the book will be entered into the competition. So that's all you need to do. On Facebook, share and let me know. On Twitter, retweet. And on Instagram, tag someone who might be interested. You have until the book's launch day, 22nd of October. And on that day, I'll pick a winner and I'll announce the winner on the episode that will come out on Monday, the 28th of October. And listen, you can enter for each platform. So if you share on Facebook, retweet on Twitter and tag a friend on Instagram, you'll be entered three times into the competition. Easy. Your chances of winning will be higher. So do it on all three if you want. If you can, if you're on all three, just do it. But you can only be entered once for each platform. So that means it's also a maximum of three entries. So good luck. Good luck. Get sharing, people. Now, one last thing before I get out of here. As you may know, my third child is due in October. And that means it could literally happen any minute. We're on high alert right at this moment. So it could happen anytime. I'm not sure when. But depending on the timing, it might mean that an episode will be late, or maybe I need to skip a week altogether. I don't know yet, but don't panic. I will be back as soon as I can, I guess, once all the diapers are changed and I don't know. But as that, just so you know, I'll be back at some point if you find that an episode is missing from your feed. And now, maybe until next week, auf Wiederhören. Auf <laughs> Wiederhören.